Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's a, it's a really nice turnout here, especially on a beautiful, beautiful day that's it's very tempting to be outside and enjoying that, that vitamin D. But um, you're going to be uh, rewarded for being inside for the next few minutes. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Rachel Barnhard. We asked Rachel to come here uh, to celebrate Constitution Day, but she's going to talk about a whole variety of other things. And um, the plan is that she's going to uh, give a little presentation, and then there's going to be a generous amount of time given to questions. Uh, questions and answers. I really encourage you to en engage with her because she's structured it the time that way. Uh, so it would be much more interactive than a traditional one. So um, you might know, uh, Rachel, if you, if you grew up in the area, if you have lived in the area for any amount of time, you probably already recognize Rachel Barnhart. But let me introduce you uh, to uh, some things you might not know. Uh, she's a graduate of Cornell University. Uh, I'd like to say it's a sister college, uh, but I think they kind of outrank us. Um, so Cornell University, uh, and she spent many years, uh, 18 years, I think it was, 18 years uh, in broadcasting uh, locally, uh, Channel 13 and ROC. Uh, and yeah, uh, so you probably recognize her from that. Or you might recognize her from uh, a few campaigns that she ran for uh, for office, and she'll be talking about that. She's also known uh, among bloggers and people who are sort of up on these things locally uh, for uh, managing uh, one of the most um, dynamic uh, local blogs called The Rochesterian, which she reports on, on news. She still does investigative reporting, uh, and uh, so she's it's not just news, but also meta-news sometimes. Uh, and also, um, I, I also encourage you to take a look at a book that she read, uh, wrote uh, called uh, Broadcasted, Gender, Media, Politics, and Taking on the Establishment, uh, based on her experiences as running, uh, in, uh, based on uh, her experiences running as a woman uh, in a local uh, Democratic uh, primary election. Um, and she was just recently um, uh, was in a campaign uh, this uh, spring and summer, and maybe some of you followed followed her based on that. So uh, I'd like to, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel Barnhart. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited at the turnout. I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the power of the pen and some threats that we are seeing right now to free press and democracy. Uh, I went to John Marshall High School in the city. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's uh, in the shadow of Kodak Park. And when I was going to Marshall, it was the early 90s, and Rochester was a much violent place. and much more violent, and my school really reflected that. It was a high poverty school, high teen pregnancy rate. I had classmates who were victims of violence, who were killed, who went to jail for committing violence, who sold drugs, and that really shaped my social justice perspective. I'm the daughter of two city school educators, grew up in a middle class household a few blocks away, but when I entered those doors every morning, I was, in a, I was in a different place. And I was always asking, why? Why does my school not have the same things that other schools have? Why do my classmates drop out while other schools, they're going to Ivy League colleges? What's going on? Well, believe it or not, asking why uh, led to a career in journalism. That started when I was in high school. I wrote an underground newspaper. See, we didn't have Twitter and Facebook back then. You actually had to print things and hand them out. So I think I burned out the toner on my dad's printer, uh, and I wrote about um, inequality, educational inequality at my high school. And that looked like a high suspension rate, a high dropout rate. Well, guess what? The principal didn't like it, and he suspended me. So I did it again, <laughs> got suspended again, didn't get into the National Honor Society. What I learned from that experience was that, hmm, little old me at 16 years old had a lot of power just by handing something out. The power of the pen. And I learned at a young age that people really don't like it when you say things that are true and that rock the boat. They don't like it at all. So of course I wanted to make a career out of it. 
And I really wanted to come home. I, I wanted to come back to Rochester because I was just so driven to cover what I thought were real problems in our community, inequality, educational problems, poverty, and frankly, violence. I mean, I, I was really touched by violence in my high school. There was a shooting on, on the, in the main hallway on a day I was there. Um, fortunately, it was not fatal, but I knew both young men and I saw one of them a few years ago, the, the victim. He's now a lineman for RG&E. And we, spot, we talked about it. And it's one of those things that just stays with you for a long time. My first job in Rochester after working a minimum wage job in Elmira, New York. I mean, can you imagine graduating from college and telling your parents you're going to go work for seven bucks an hour? <laughs> I was making more at Wegmans at the time. But that's what you had to do back then. And... I worked in Elmira for a year, year and a half, learned how to shoot, write, edit, swept the floors, did everything I could to come back home and learn what I needed to do to come back home. And my first job here was at what's now Spectrum News, the cable uh, outlet. And uh, I was a reporter and a producer. I didn't want to produce, but one thing you'll learn is sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do to get ahead. Sometimes you have to take that job uh, and, and, and pay your dues. And I did that for a while, and I loved it. I, I was really, I said, this is what I'm doing with the rest of my life. I'm going to be a local news reporter. I love it. And, and it, you know, I was able to really report on the things that were important to me. I was able to report on the city school district. I was able to report on urban violence. And I was able to do all those things. And I was able to grow as a storyteller, and I was able to uh, grow as an investigative reporter, uh, learning how to file open records requests and... Um, and I was still using that power of the pen to stir the pot, ask tough questions of our local officials, and always asking why. Hey, you promised to do this. Why hasn't that happened? Um, you said this, but now you're saying this. Hmm, what, ha what changed? And it got to the point where when people saw me coming, um, the mayor saw me coming or the county executive, they wanted to go the other direction. That meant I was doing my job. I thought it was fun. You know, one, that's one of the main things that we need the local press for, is accountability. Who else is watching government? Who else has access to those officials to ask those questions and make sure that they're doing what they said they were going to do, to make sure that your tax dollars are being spent wisely, to make sure that there's no corruption. You know, I'm very proud of stories that I did on exposing cuts to the local parole office after we had several parolees commit very high profile crimes. I exposed very bloated administration and salaries at the Rochester City School District, which caused a change in policy. That's having an impact. The School Board of Education changed their policy about perks that they gave administrators because I exposed it. And the other thing that is really important is informing all of you about what's going on in your government, but also about candidates running for office. Letting you know who's gonna, who you can pull the lever for at the ballot box. Those things are important. And I learned just how important those things were later on. Now there, there is a little bit of a threat to this dynamic um, that I just talked about and all the things that I loved about local news. And that threat started to happen in the mid 2000s. When, what happened in the mid-2000s with news? Anyone? What was starting to happen then? Digital. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be, uh, when I started off in 1998, uh, you saw my story on the 6 o'clock news, and unless you had a v VCR or whatever, you know, VHS tape, you didn't see my story again. You didn't get to read it or anything. Times have changed. When digital happened, um, all of a sudden, you know, Twitter and Facebook and uh, websites, I had to write stories for the web, and I loved it. I thought, this is great, because all of a sudden, you were able to tell me what was important to you. You were able to tell me if you liked something or didn't. You were able to tell me, I've got an idea. Or, hey, you know, this thing is happening to me in my life. Is, is this something that interests you? 
there was just this constant flow of information and news was no longer top down. And I found it really energizing to just, it, and I just found it equalizing. I mean, the press is here to serve you. And I loved the fact that you were all of a sudden holding us accountable and involved. I loved it. And I loved being able to share information in different ways. But what happened with that was that people, fewer people started watching television news. Fewer people started reading the newspaper. And at the same time, you had giant corporations gobbling up local television stations all around the country. And they were finding efficiencies. And they were also discovering that they could pay people nothing and get them to do the work. And here's a really sad statistic. In 2006, I was working at Channel 8, and I was 30 years old, and I was earning about $40,000, $42,000 a year. When I left Channel 8 in 2016, 10 years later, reporters that age were making about $25,000, $30,000. What do you think the impact of that is? Well, it, means, it means you're going to not get um, experienced people to, to do the work. It means you're going to lose a lot of institutional knowledge in newsrooms because people won't be able to earn a living in, in their own communities anymore. I was the last generation, I mean, I'm Gen X, and I was the last generation that will probably be able to stay in one place uh, in local news. The millennial generation won't be able to do that. They won't be able to make a life in, in a mid-sized city like this and report the news for years and years. And what I found happening was that there the newsrooms were filled with reporters who were wonderful young people, but there was nobody who had any context for anything. What's parcel, I, I spent my whole days explaining what, here's what parcel five is, um, here's who Bill Johnson is, here's what the fast ferry is. People didn't know. And it was very concerning to me because the public deserves more news than car accidents, fires, the real quick hit easy stuff. Um, you deserve context, um, investigative reporting, um, things that are in depth, and that was really slowly going away. And it was going away because no one was getting paid to stick around and do it. Uh, and so it became this vicious cycle. And I, I think that's, um, and studies have shown that what I'm saying is true. Uh, local news, uh, television news, is not focused on uh, government reporting, uh, investigative reporting, anywhere near uh, the way it used to be. And I think that's really sad. And newspapers, of course, have also uh, faced tremendous change. I think there are 45, uh, 45 uh, no, newspaper employment dropped 45% between uh, 2008 and 2017. That's tens of thousands of people who can no longer bring you information. And while uh, the jobs in newsrooms are being cut, uh, you might have only two reporters on during the day at, um, at a local television station. There used to be five or six when I started. So while this is all happening and the newsrooms are shrinking and people aren't getting paid to stick around, there's another industry that's exploding. And that's public relations. Any of you public relations majors here? No? OK. Um, Public relations is exploding at the same time. And, and the effect of that is that, I mean, what, do, what, what is public relations? It's people who spin. It's people who um, are paid to provide the perspective of a company, um, a movie star, um, or government. During my career, I saw government communication staffs I, I mean, start with maybe two or three people at City Hall. I mean, one time Bill Johnson dragged his own podium out to the middle of the atrium uh, to give a press conference. That would never happen today. Now these staffs have 10 to 15 people. Some of the government uh, communications organizations have their own television studios. They operate like newsrooms. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is well, they're telling you what they want you to know. And in some cases, it's very vital, it's vital information. You know, maybe you want to know what's going on at the zoo. 
But in, in some cases, uh, it, it's information that really needs to be fact-checked. And I think that that is a real threat to the press, and it's a threat to democracy, if, if to have this gigantic imbalance. I think ProPublica did a story back in 2011 that said, for every reporter, there are now three public relations employees in this country. That's what these reporters are up against, to kind of sift through the propaganda and, and, and find the truth. And so I, I think that's a, a threat to the press. And the other thing that's happening, I mentioned that these big companies are swallowing up um, news stations around the country. Well, one of them is really abusing that power. How many of you have heard about Sinclair Broadcasting? They own Channel 13 in Rochester, and I worked for Channel 13 when Sinclair took over, and there were things that were very troubling. I was a Sunday night anchor at the time, and the producer had in the, in the rundown, that's the order of the stories, the story about a, a woman, it, cause we, so when you have these national networks, you can get stories from all over the country and just feed them to each station. And Sinclair had what are called must runs, which means you gotta run it. They tell you to run it, you gotta run it. Well, I see in the rundown this story about a woman who is eligible to collect all of these welfare benefits from childcare to food stamps to, I don't know. But it added up to something like $82,000 a year and how dare she get all this money? And I thought, oh no. It had no competing perspective. The story didn't even say if she was getting all of those benefits. And the woman made $19,000 a year and had two children and we're doing a story about how dare she be entitled to any help. And I complained. I said, I don't want this in my show. Well, it turns out the guy who works Saturday nights didn't want it in his show either, so it ended up in mine. <laughs> and um, it, it ended up running, and I sent an email to the reporter who was in a different city and um, sent an email to my boss, sent an email to the big boss, because, you know, I don't, I don't care. I just say things. And I said, well, they sent an email back to me saying, you know, well, Fox News ran the story, so it must have been pretty good. And that was the end of that. And, uh, and I knew, and the Saturday Night Anchor, Adam Chodak, he's now a channel, like, we knew, we gotta get out of here. This is, I don't like the way this is going. And we, we did. More recently, we've seen Sinclair um, force their news anchors to read scripts about um, their role in journalism. And the underlying message is, those guys over there, they don't know what they're talking about, we do this us versus them. And Fox News is very good at this too. You know, how many stories do they do? This, you're only gonna see this on Fox News, you're not gonna see this anywhere else. And they, they make you think that um, every, everyone else is tainted and slanted and we're the only ones who have it right. I think that's really dangerous. I mean, we should be welcoming all different viewpoints and perspectives and we shouldn't be telling you not to get your news from somewhere else. You should be sampling everything. Um, and studies have shown that Fox News uh, viewers, and by the way, MSNBC is not that far behind, are less informed about current events. And that their pundits and guests make a lot of false statements. That's just really concerning. Um, I, I don't believe that they are, um, that they do a lot of good journalism. And the good journalism that they do is being swallowed up by this propaganda machine. That's not responsible. It just isn't, and it's, and it's dangerous. And we're certainly seeing it from the president. I'm sorry if any of you support him. But I do think that when, um, when you have people in power, whether it's the president or, hey, our, the Rochester mayor did this, um, did, has done the same thing, really attacking the press. Um, I, the press has a job to hold government accountable. And if you can't deal with that, you should not be in office. But to turn people against the press um, that's that's dangerous, and uh, it's not it's not democratic. And, and there's there's another trend in um, politics that I, I wanted to also talk about, or not politics, press that has to do with politics that I wanted to talk about that I think is also a threat to democracy as well. So I've I've talked to you about shrinking newsrooms, and I've talked to you about the growing PR machines. There's there's another threat that I 
went head on into, and that is money in politics. It is a big problem in our country. Uh, how many of you know what Citizens United is? Okay. There, the Citizens United was a Supreme Court case in 2010 that really um, lifted a lot of regulations on money in politics. And it ruled that corporations are people and corporations can spend as much as they want to on elections. Elections, um, the reason we care about money in politics is that money is used to buy television commercials, it's used to send you mailings, used to buy radio ads, digital ads, it's used to pay people to knock on your door, it's used in all kinds of ways to influence you. It's why Robert Mueller is looking at the Rus at Russians uh, attempt to influence our elections. It's not just about foreign agents trying to influence us, it's also about the role of money uh, being used to sway us and our votes. When you don't have a thriving press, you're going to hear more directly from government, you're going to hear more directly from candidates, and you're going to see a lot more abuses of government uh, to um, used in a way to promote campaigns. We've seen this at the state level and the local level. And that is also something that I think uh, is not democratic. What we need is a lot more reporting about money in politics. How many of you know how much money was spent in this last congressional election? I don't know why you would know, because no one reported on it. You know, uh, so I, I recently ran for Congress, and uh, it was a great. Ex it was just. It was a great experience. I spent $35,000, the guy who won spent $461,000. This happened over two months. So he spent 28 bucks a vote, I spent $5 a vote. I don't know, who's the better candidate? <laughs> Certainly efficient. Um, but when you, start, when, you, when you run up against that and you realize that you know, you're racing against the clock to reach as many people as possible, whether it's through mail, I was only able to send one mailer to a very small group of people. Um, when you're, when, you're, when you're racing against that clock trying to reach as many people as possible and you realize that your opponent is bombing mailboxes and has a paid army of staff knocking on doors and making phone calls, there's nothing you can do. You might be able to do something if they're spending four or five times as much as you, but there's nothing you can do in that situation at all. And that, that was a hard lesson for me. Um, you know, I, I got into politics because, um, well, a couple of reasons against the backdrop of the problems that I was talking about in television news, I said, well, how can I use my voice in a different way? And I wanted to make a difference in a different way. And I really felt that I wasn't able to do that effectively anymore in television news. And I wanted to try something else. And I was disappointed in our local leaders. But I, I learned some things. After 20 years of covering politics, I learned that it's really hard. And I learned that people are really busy. And as much as I thought they were all watching my stories, they weren't. Because people are busy. And you can do, we have an obligation to provide as much election coverage as possible and to let people know who the candidates are. But a lot of people don't consume that. And it makes money that much more important. Um, so that's one of the things that I learned, and that was really tough, and it made me a really big advocate for campaign finance reform and public uh, campaign financing. There's a lot that we can do to make these more fair contests. They will never be fair contests, ever. People in power have the ability to give you stuff that I don't have. Um, but there are things that we can do to make sure everyone is heard and heard more fairly, particularly in the absence of a robust press that's able to uh, contribute. All of this means that we're at a moment in time where we've got a problem with corruption. <laughs> we have a problem with elected officials, with bureaucrats, with governments, not always doing what they're supposed to do because no one's looking. And in this environment where you've got an overwhelming amount of money in politics, you've got shrinking amount of reporters and you've got more and more PR people sending out those messages. Um, 
I'm very concerned uh, about where we are, both locally on a statewide level and nationally. I still believe in the power of the patent. Uh, I really do, which is why I founded, um, so I, I'm not really doing my Rochesterian blog anymore. Uh, I founded a, a nonprofit called Rochester for All. Our website's not that great, it's being redesigned right now. But I founded um, a nonprofit called Rochester for All, and it's a watchdog group. Uh, we care about fiscal responsibility, nonpartisan, fiscal responsibility, ethics and transparency and accountability in government. And very similar to Citizens Union in New York City, which has a publication called Gotham Gazette. So I'm sort of returning to my roots, and we've already filed a number of open records requests that have yielded um, what I think are some pretty shocking things about how federal dollars have been spent in the city. Um, we paid for the Morton Steakhouse. I didn't know that. No one else does either. Um, those are the types of things that we are discovering. And so I'm trying to figure out now how to build a model to, to market it and get people to read it and fund it. Um, but I think that's where journalism is going now. We're seeing lots of nonprofit news organizations across the country. Um, some of them are pure journalism. Some of them are advocacy, which is kind of more what we're doing is more advocacy. Uh, there's a gap. There's a need. Uh, we have to figure out new ways to fund it. Um, I just see right now a lot of problems. And someone referred, uh, referred to it as the broken windows theory of ethics. So the broken windows theory of policing is that when you have a broken window and you don't ad address it, um, more windows break and then crime starts to flourish because the first problem wasn't addressed. That's been debunked a little bit, but the broken window theory of ethics is that if you ignore the small problems, then all of a sudden you start to tolerate bigger and bigger and bigger ethical problems. And then all of us say, well, we just shrug and say, well, they all do it. We've, we've got to address the small ethics problems and the big ethics problems, and we have a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them uh, in our community right now. We, um, for example, we, one of our uh, open records requests found that the deputy mayor put in for time that he said he was working on a day that he was getting paid while he was at a conference out of town. That's illegal. That's not only unethical, that's illegal. Um, and so we filed an ethics complaint with the city. They, they said they didn't care. <laughs> so we're finding so many things like that. And we, um, and it's not just the city. We're also paying attention to the Monroe County Industrial Development Agency, which is awarding tax breaks to people under federal investigation for mortgage fraud. I don't really think that's a good idea. But we're at, we're at a point in time right now where I'm the only one saying this stuff. <laughs> And I think that's a problem. And I'm the only one saying it because the press isn't reporting on it. And it's very concerning to me, which is why I ran for office, and which is why I'm still in the fight, but just have to do it a different way. Um, so there is hope. Uh, and my goals are to really get the word out about some of the problems as it pertains to ethical problems and corruption. But also, let's talk about campaign finance. Let's connect those dots between policy decisions and, um, and, and money. And let's talk about the influence of money in, in elections and in, uh, on policy. And so I really want to raise awareness of those issues. And so that's what I see myself doing right now. And uh, so there is, there is a way forward. It's not all doom and gloom, but it's, we're not in a great place. So thank you very much. I'd like to take some questions. Anyone? Yes. I'm an idealist. I'm not a cynic. Believe it or not, I am not a cynic. Because if you're a cynic, you don't you stop asking questions and you just leave things the way they are and you think nothing will ever change. Uh, I don't believe that. 
And I don't believe I've lost elections because people didn't like me or because I just, I believe that um, it's much more complicated. <laughs> it's way more complicated. Um, I believe that you have to be persistent. You have to keep trying. And, um, and I do believe that there is a lack of awareness about a lot of things. Now, that doesn't mean if you all learn about campaign finance reform, you're going to vote for me or vote for the other person who wants to reform. That, that does, but if you don't know, people have to know and they have to care. I mean, one of the things that's really frustrating to me is, um, and, and this is true, uh, you know, I've run in Democratic primaries, and one of the things that I've learned is that Democrats who vote in primaries, corruption's not a top issue, which explains a lot for me. Uh, ethics and corruption are not top issues. And in fact, I met with Joe Morelli, um, who I ran against for Congress. I met with him uh, right before Louise Slaughter passed away, and he told me they have polling data showing that ethics is not a top issue, which also explains a lot. Um, so how do we change that dynamic? Um, right now, voters care a lot about Trump. I mean, in the Democratic Party, that's it. That's all people care about. That's everyone rushing to the polls to vote against Trump in a Democratic primary. But that, that's what they're running on. Pay close attention to this in November. I mean, that is what your Democrats are running on. One issue, Trump. Who can best fight Donald Trump? I don't think that's going to get us very far. But... Um, Yes, I, I believe that we have to change the conversation a lot. I do. I think we have to change the conversation and start talking about these issues more. I've gotten heat, by the way, for talking about this stuff. I mean, you know, when you lose an election, you're supposed to crawl under a rock and never be heard from again. Um, I didn't do that. I, I, I wrote a book about my first run for office because it was just... Um, I just was so naive. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to be up against. And I feel we have to talk about these issues in order to affect change. If you don't talk about it, it's just going to stay the same. So yes, I have hope. But it's going to be tough. <laughs> it's going to be tough. I'm so glad you asked that because one of the things that I've struggled with, certainly running for office and you know being on the other side of the microphone and seeing coverage, just you know you just want to tear your hair out and say that's not fair, that's not what I said. Well, who's who holds journalists accountable? The answer to that is you do. I mean, you hold journalists accountable, and we have to do a better job speaking up about what what it is that we want. We ha probably have to do a better job supporting organizations that we think are doing a good job, whether it's through a subscription or a donation. Like WXXI, I'm a member. I think they do a wonderful job. Um, and But as far as that lack of context, um, we probably need to teach more media literacy, um, starting in high school, how to evaluate um, documents, how to evaluate sources, how to ask critical questions. Um, those are things we're just now thinking about in the era of fake news, which is a really big problem. We 
are not probably training journalists the way that the way that we should. Um, I I have a huge interest in um, being part of helping a new generation of journalists. Um, and I don't know if that means I want to teach, but it, 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 I have a really big interest of helping a new generation of journalists make those connections, reject press release journalism. Press release journalism is when that big PR machine that I talked about, they send stuff and you just re rewrite it and put it on the news. That happens all the time, all the time. And it's happening because the newsrooms are shrinking and they need to fill content. All, they just need to fill content. And it's like you're just on a hamster on a wheel all day long. And, and so the story that you read, I guarantee you, was a reporter who was a hamster on a wheel having to just fill space. No one has time sometimes to provide that context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so in Rochester, I mean, the Democrat and Chronicle should be doing that work. But if you go to their website right now, you're going to see a lot about high school football. You're going to see great restaurants. You're going to see some brewery stories. And you might see a couple news stories. It's unacceptable. And I know the people there. They're wonderful, wonderful people. But they are owned by a corporation that has a formula. That formula is not working for us. I mean, you can go to my Rochester for All website, and again, we're redesigning it, I apologize, but you'll see information that absolutely should have been reported by the local paper. I, and I, told, I sent out press releases, and I said, look, this is happening, this is wrong, and they're just starting to kind of pick up on it, but that's, my, that's me trying to hold them accountable and say, this should be, you should be reporting on this. Our tax dollars went to the East Ave Wegmans. Our tax dollars went to Morton's downtown. And nobody knew about it. They made these deals in secret. That's wrong. Gets, gets me angry. Like, that's wrong. And why aren't you reporting on it? I know you weren't first. Put the ego aside. Do it. And, you know, the Democrat and Chronicle is our best hope. They really are. And the only way they're going to improve, it, improve is if we push them to do so. But nonprofit news, I think, is the way forward, and and that's you know I don't I don't know if my group will end up being that robust because we have a pretty narrow focus, but I do think we're going to see more organizations like that. I think it's all of the above. Um, and that's where I get so frustrated with Fox News because they're, pro and the president, they're promoting that attitude that everything you see over there is just not true. Everything you read in the New York Times, not true. What you need to look for is organizations that correct themselves. If, if, if an organization makes a mistake and does not correct itself, it's not a good news organization. Any organization that has high standards will correct itself and will post corrections. Any organization that does that is, is an organization that does not peddle in fake news. That's our mainstream outlets. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Those are organizations I trust. I trust NPR. Um, I trust, and I don't, I listen to NPR all the time. They do not have a liberal bent. They do not. They take great pains to have on multiple perspectives. And they give them plenty of time. Um, the, but if people are looking for that confirmation bias, I don't know what we do about that. Um, I don't know what we do. That's a symptom of gross polarization right now. And it's a symptom of people like Alex Jones, Breitbart, Steve Bannon, who are masters at propaganda. They, and they, ad, they admit it. I mean, they're proud of this. It's very, very concerning. The only thing we can continue to do is fact check, fact check, fact check. There's a whole industry now of fact checking. And it's unfortunate because that industry of fact checking, while it's performing an amazing public service for all of us, that's just news that they can't do. That's, that's just them telling you what's not real. 
instead of reporting new things and holding people accountable and reporting on vital issues in our country, instead they're spending an enormous amount of time wading through muck. And I think that's a shame. It's a really, um, really good question. One of the things that struck me when I first ran for office, um, so for 18 years I you know, thought I had a lot of stature in the community, thought I was really doing a public service. I mean, people come to me every day um, still with problems that they want, um, that they need help either solving or that they want to expose. But one of the things that struck me was how little respect the public has for journalists. <laughs> and this is before the age of Trump when I first ran for office. I mean, this is way before the age of Trump. Um, people didn't, um, people really didn't seem to understand what it was that I had done with my life. And that was so disappointing to me. It was shocking to me um, that um, people thought I just read the news every night and put on makeup. That was upsetting or they thought that I had some weird agenda to hurt people. Um, that was tough. So there is sort of a, the, and, and, and polls show, reporters are uh, some of the least respected and trusted people in America. Uh, even now, when journalists really are on the front line of fake news and on the front line of holding this White House accountable, even now, um, journalists don't rank very highly um, that, that was disappointing to me. Uh, so I think, you, I think it's fundamental to uh, American democracy, to a liberal democracy, to have a, a free press. And I don't think we want to dip our toe into going in any other direction. We're just going to have to fight this battle a, a different way. We're going to have to just educate people about... Um, bad actors, about what fake news is, about missing context, but I would really hate to see us roll back any freedoms. And, you know, you started to see, it was under the Obama administration that started prosecuting leaks, uh, I mean, skyrocketed under his administration. I mean, we've seen, uh, and certainly I've seen even on the local and state level, uh, over time, transparency has really um, decreased over time in both Democratic and Republican uh, administrations. So if anything, that, that I see as, as a little bit more of a problem, but uh, all, all of this is, um, all of this to me is not an argument to roll back press freedoms. If anything, it's an argument to have a more robust press that's able to um, combat some of the, the bad actors right now. I mean, the reason that Fox News can thrive, the reason Sinclair is doing what it's doing, the environment's perfect for them to do it. They don't have a lot of competition. <laughs> sure. Well, anytime I speak to college students, I always, um, ask them to read the newspaper every day. You don't have to read a print copy, but I, I you know, really encourage you to con be a news consumer, uh, whether it's NPR, the New York Times, the Democratic Chronicle, I think it's so important to be informed of what's going on in your community, in your state, and in your country. Because when you, when you consume news, you're not only learning what's going on today, you learn a lot about history, you also learn what's gonna happen tomorrow. You're so prepared for what's happening tomorrow. You can see it a mile away. So 
I think to part of being um, part of citizenship is not just following laws. I mean, that's the basic part of citizenship. The basic part of being a member of society is you agree to follow laws. You don't have to vote. You don't have to be informed. You don't have to help people. You don't have to do anything. But, you know, we can strive to a higher form of citizenship, which, in, which means being informed. And I think the first step is to be informed about what's going on in your community. And the next step is to vote. Learn about candidates. Um, that level of engagement is really, really important. And it doesn't sound like much. I know it doesn't sound like much, but you'd be surprised. I mean, I've, I've had reporters, I've sat across from reporters in newsrooms who didn't read the paper that morning. Drives me nuts. Um, read the paper. Uh, you've, you've got to be informed about what's going on. No matter what profession you're entering, it is just very important. Yeah, so I don't have a public relations team, I'm it. Uh, and that's the problem. <laughs> uh, I need to find a model that works for my nonprofit, and so we're kind of going through that right now. I'm looking at some, I'm looking at some other nonprofit startups uh, across the country. Investigative Post in Buffalo is probably the best model for me, although I'm also involved in advocacy, so we're not just, just doing journalism. We're also advocating for really good policies uh, in terms of good government and fiscal accountability and campaign finance reform and whatnot. So that is my big challenge. Um, I don't see anything changing in terms of the PR machine slowing down. PR jobs, uh, I think I just read an article, are expected to keep going up and up and up and up. And journalism jobs are just going to keep going down and down and down and down. Um, that dynamic isn't going to change. And I think, um, I think that is a really big challenge. Uh, that's a really big challenge. I'll tell you a little side thing that I'm doing. Um, I am doing the press for Stephanie Miner, who's running for governor. How many of you have heard of her? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, so Stephanie Miner was the mayor of Syracuse um, for the last eight years. She was term limited out. And I remember back in 2013, she wrote an op-ed in the New York Times blasting Governor Cuomo for not fixing pipes and wanting to give Syracuse money for all these, you know, she calls them cotton candy developments. Sound familiar? And, uh, and so I just remember thinking, wow, I really like her. <laughs> she's running as an independent for governor. She's a Democrat. And she used to be co-chair of the state Democratic Party. And she's running as a Democrat. I'm um, sorry, she's running as an independent because she says the party uh, doesn't care about corruption. They don't care about campaign finance reform. They care about all these ridiculous economic development things. And I'm running as an independent. Crazy, right? Um, so I, uh, after the congressional campaign ended, I called her. And I said, well, what can I do for you? Because I... Um, I just I believe in you. And uh, so push come to shove, I, and I'm now writing her press releases, and it's hilarious because when I, so I'm doing PR. Uh, but I, um, uh, when, when I write her press releases, it's funny because they don't change anything because we speak in this, we say the same thing, so they don't change anything I write. Um, but that's only until November. And I, uh, I, the other candidate that I was really supporting and uh, was Zephyr Teachout. Do you all know who she is? She was the other person who really inspired me um, to do politics. She just ran for attorney general, and her big thing is corruption. Again, voters, voters and corruption. Yeah. So she and I are now in the three-time loser club together. But I don't know. I kind of like the club I'm in if she's in it. Um, she, she, uh, she's just wonderful. And she really cares about all the things that, I, that I've talked to you about today. And, uh, you know, I hope she keeps going. I'm going to keep going. I'll run for office again one day. Hopefully not soon. I need a break. Um, you know, I'll, and I'm getting my um, master's in public administration right now from Syracuse University. Um, they have an online program at night, which is very rigorous. These online programs are something else. And economics is really hard. Uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying that. And it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, 
there are many ways that, that you know, we can all contribute. And so I, I have some balls in the air, but Rochester for All is going to be my, uh, my labor of love that I'm hoping to, to stabilize. Thank you so much.